Talk to me about time-restricted feeding, because for a long time, that was like the hot new girl in school and everyone loved it and it was really interesting. But it seems like the trend is swaying at least a little bit away from time-restricted feeding, especially on a morning. So what's your, how do you conceptualize all of this now? Um, so time-restricted feeding or time-restricted eating, you know, it, the, it it's a form of intermittent fasting, right? And I think that many people, when they think about intermittent fasting, they think, okay, well, I just need to skip a meal. I need to like have a period of, I need to extend my period of time where I'm not eating. And the easiest way to do that is skip, skip a meal. Um, and that's kind of what happened. So, you know, Dr. Sachin Panda, a good friend of mine, big, you know, circadian biologist researcher, does a lot of research on time-restricted feeding. And, um, you know, we talked about this like almost 10 years ago. Essentially, there's a circadian reason to eat your food within a certain time window and then have a period of rest and fasting, right? So everything on our body runs on a clock and including our metabolism. And, um, you know, so, so we're most insulin sensitive in the morning, least sensitive, uh, uh, insulin sensitive in the evening, right? So, you know, your blood glucose levels will go much higher with the same carbohydrate intake in the evening versus the morning, even, you know, just calories are the same, everything's the same. There's also some argument to be made by you just need a period of rest. Like, your gut, digestion, all that, like energy is being diverted to do that when you're digesting food. Like that's that's a big thing. And there's also a lot of responses that happen after you eat a meal, causing inflammation and things like that that divert energy there. So it's taking energy away from other things like repair. So so repairing processes usually happen when you're in a fasted state. So just like when you're sleeping, your brain shuts down, right? Like your brain, if you didn't sleep, your brain's not going to repair. It's not going to stop. Like you need that rest period. Well, the same goes for like other organs. Like it need they need a rest period. And and so it's really important to have that rest period, right? So the longer the rest it, the longer the rest period is, the better in terms of like having enough energy to like do those repair processes. Things like that require energy and there's also, you know, other reasons as well. But generally speaking, um there's an argument why it's good to have a rest period, a fasting period, right? And is that, does it need to be 16 hours? Does it need to be 20? Does it need to be 12? Like, I don't, I don't really know that we know the exact time um, to that. But what we do know is that talking about this to the public was translated to, I need to skip breakfast. That was like, the take home was, okay, I need to do a 16 hour, I need to do eat my food within eight hours and do a 16 hour fast. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to skip breakfast and yeah. keep, extend my fast. Lunch period. at 12, have dinner right. at eight, graze between then and, and that was, it's hands off. Exactly. And that was, that was kind of the, the take home, the practical implication there that everyone started doing. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, so our muscle is the biggest reservoir for amino acids, just like you know, we store glucose as glycogen in our liver and our muscle. We store um, triglyceride as, you know, you know, we fat as triglycerides in our adipose tissue. We don't really store muscle. I mean, we don't really store amino acids, but you can kind of think of the muscle as a reservoir for it. Because when we have a period of um, basically we're not getting an intake of amino acids, we need it. We need amino acids to survive. Like we need them. And so our body pulls from our muscle. So in the morning, if you think about it, what's the longest period you go without having amino acids? Well, it's when you're sleeping. So breakfast is actually really important. It's, in, it's important to get protein, amino acids in that first meal, because if you extend that, me if you extend that fasting period by skipping breakfast, your body is going to be like, I need protein. I need, I got to make a bunch of proteins to like have my heart beat and my kidneys function, right? So it's going to pull amino acids out of your muscle. And so um, that can cause muscle atrophy, particularly if you're not doing resistance training. So amino acid is one way to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Um, the other way to do it would be resistance training. So there have been studies done, like, for example, women that are doing time-restricted feeding, they will not lose muscle mass if they're doing resistance training. Mm. So does it mitigate the gains of resistance training? By doing that, it mitigates the the atrophy. So it, it's mitigating. No, the sorry. Does time restricted feeding, i.e., skipping breakfast, limit the gains made from resistance training if 
both of those things are done together? N- not not if you're getting enough protein. I mean, it, it, not in that study, at least. Understood. I think I think if you're not getting enough protein within 24 hour period, yes. But like if you're getting so so the, to get your gains in, and I'm sure you've had people on talking about this, but like the RDA for protein is. 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And that was like determined like forever ago when we were using older techniques, we as in scientists, not me, because I haven't personally done this experiment, but um, the scientific community was using techniques that uh, underestimated amino acid losses. So so these committees were set up to determine, okay, how many, how much amino acids, do, you know, how, what quantity of amino acids do we lose every day? And how much do we make sure we have to get each day to replenish that, right? Um, and so those losses were underestimated. In other words, we're losing more than they thought. And so what what does that mean? That means, oh, maybe when the RDA for protein is too low. So people like Dr. Stuart Phillips and others have now redone these experiments with like newer, more sensitive technologies because that's what happens with time, right? We get better technologies, more sensitivity. And they've now determined that it's actually 1.2 grams per kilogram to just bare minimum prevent losses. It's and another if you're doing 50% on top of what was originally. 50% on what originally. And if you're actually doing, phys- if you're physically active, if you're doing resistance training, that goes up to 1.6 wow. grams per and kilogram that's the minimum. And well, 1.2 was the minimum, but like yep. to like build muscle yep. to get the gains you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And there's actually been studies done in older adults. This is a big problem. Older adults are, they're not as sensitive to amino acids. It's called anabolic resistance. So with the same protein intake, they won't build as much muscle if they're 65 versus when they were 35. So granddad needs to be cooking twice as many steaks. He needs basically. twice as many steaks. And there have been studies looking at the actual RDA of older adults get 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And then the other group gets 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight. The group that got 1.2 has much higher muscle mass gains. Yep. And and just pre- actually prevents the atrophy that is ha- is happening just with age. 